Good afternoon, fellow abortion survivors. Every one of us here is one of them. Now, the theme that Jane gave this conference is, are we in a hybrid war against science and the West? And the answer is, of course. The war is uh, against biology, as far as my subject matter is concerned. It is against evidence, uh, such as sonograms and others. Uh, and the other side of the argument is never using arguments from science. And it is a war against the West. It's a war against Western ideals, culture, individual human rights, against Western philosophy, and against the Enlightenment. I'll talk about, uh, I'll talk about some of these uh, subheadings a little further down the road. Question is how to resist and abolish child murder for hire and its trafficking. I'm trying to avoid the word abortion because it's such a clinical term and it doesn't describe the reality of what is happening. The reality is child murder. And basically, if you are more on the pro-life spectrum than on the other side, you have uh, two possible reactions. Everybody can take actions to help achieve these worthwhile goals, do something about abortion. In other words, I will and I do. And the other one, much more frequent, is I have no idea about this. It's an uncomfortable subject. I am helpless. I give up. So let's take the uh, 35 to 40,000 foot high view of this problem. Abortion or child murder is the largest killer of human beings in the history of mankind. Worldwide, the number is exceeding 1.5 billion people. In this country alone, way over 65 million since the Roe v. Wade pro-abortion decision by the Supreme Court that was recalled two uh, years ago. If you look on the right-hand side of the picture, all these red crosses, each one of them stands for one million aborted babies. And down on the bottom, you see one and a half black crosses, and those are the American casualties from every war, cumulative, since 1775. And it definitely puts an ironic twist on the quote by Jordan Peterson, almost everyone is their better self around children. We are very um, loose with our use of terminology. We call it a war against the unborn, a war against prenatal children. But is it really a war? Who is actually shooting in this war? Are both sides doing it? Now, we do have so-called problem or caring pregnancy centers, and then a lot of people, they pray, and you may have heard that when people are told about the murder of pre-born children, I'll pray about it. Do you know of any war that was ever won by medics or by prayer warriors? Medics are necessary in any war, obviously. I don't have to tell this audience. But are they sufficient? Who benefits by negotiating and by talking before there is a ceasefire in a war? And how can we win a war unless we press the advantage after each one battle? Two years ago, the Supreme Court reversed itself. And what is the result? I have seen absolutely no change by the mainline pro-life organizations in this country in either strategy or tactics in the last two years. The so-called pro-life community was utterly unprepared for anything following that Supreme Court decision. Contrast that with different movements. Other movements that achieved success in a few decades by unrelenting effort, whether it's a gay movement, a LGBTQ or alphabet soup movement, or whether it's the environmental movement, Greenpeace, they are all much higher in the conscience of the public 
they all rate much higher than the pro-life effort. And we have the evidence on our side. We have the pictures from the sonograms. On the left side, you have an individual. On the right side, there's actually a twin pregnancy. We know, science tells us, biology tells us, when there is a pregnant woman, she is a mother, whether she wants to or not. Her only choice is whether she is a mother of a live baby or a dead one. And by the way, the same thing is valid for the father. Anyone involved, any male involved in getting a woman pregnant is a father, whether he wants to or not. Now let's look a little bit at the arguments from the other side. This, these are quotes from the book Abortion Practice by Warren Hearn, who has been practicing late-term abortions in Boulder, Colorado for 50 plus years. Look at the jargon. I think especially the physicians in the audience will appreciate this. Neoplastic, endoparasitic, auto-infection, etc., etc. And then really comes a zinger due to the comparative mortality risk, which he says is higher for abortion, uh, higher for uh, carrying a pregnancy so, to term than for abortion. The uh, abortion is the indicated treatment of choice. And in this sense, the distinction between elective, elective and therapeutic abortion is doesn't exist. In essence, what he says is, if the patient comes to me, and the pregnant lady comes to me, and she says, my pregnancy is an illness, I will treat it as an illness, and I'll get rid of it. The patient decides. This is a medical technician of the worst sort that is not a physician, obviously. And just to give you a couple other examples, uh, you know, call the dead baby a clump of cells is one thing, but then uh, make it sort of scientific sounding and call it devitalized issue, tissue. You know, so a uh, murder, you execute an electrical chair after you're done with him, it's a devitalized tissue. And then um, for a particular nasty kind of abortion, the adjunctive urea, uh, urea immunoinfusion, uh, to make sure that the baby is dead, you run a Doppler inaudible to the patient to, show the, to determine the presence or absence of fetal heart tones. Just don't give the patient the information that this might have been a living human being. Enough of that. Let's go back to fundamentals. I think we all need to recall the uh, beginnings of the Enlightenment, the philosophy enli of, en to, of Enlightenment in Western culture. And there's nobody better to quote than Immanuel Kant, the Prussian philosopher, who probably gave the best definition of it. Enlightenment is man's escape from self-imposed maturity, which is the inability to use one's, one's mind without a chaperone. By the way, I used, uh, I'm bilingual, German and, uh, and English, so I sharpened the translation a little bit that you usually find in books. This immature is self -inflict, immaturity is self-inflicted, and it shows a lack of resolve and courage, rather than a lack of understanding. Then he uses his Latin phrase, sapere aude, that means dare to think for yourself. That's the motto of the Enlightenment. And then he mentions the opposite. Laziness and cowardice are the main reason why so many human beings, long after they should have grown up, remain immature all their lives. And then comes a real damning sen sentence. It is obviously quite comfortable to remain immature. And that is the attitude of most people to abortion. It is much more com comfortable to look away and not to get engaged, because once we get engaged, we risk that maybe our conscience tells us we actually have to act on what we know. So we don't really want to know. Now, the French are known, or at least famous for, supposedly being very rational people. Well. They were very immature and irrational when, in March of this year, they actually put a universal human right to abortion into the French Constitution and then celebrated it on the Eiffel Tower in both French and English, as you can see there. 
But do we really, are we really justified in gloating about these damn French? Again, something fundamental, and I did not come up with this, and I can unfortunately not tell you who is the author of this quote, but a German uh, website, that's where I found this and then translated it. We have been focusing far too little on the absurdity hiding behind the proclaimed constitutionally guaranteed human right to abortion, because if humans are endowed with a universal human right, then all right, all humans must be entitled to such a right simultaneously, without resulting in any harm to other human beings. Otherwise, how can we call it universal? But that is not possible in the case of prenatal homicide, even if we say that pre-born children are not humans. Here's the next one. Because if all pregnant women who supposedly have this universal human right exercised it at the same time, their community, society, or state would cease to exist. Conversely, if the continued existence of society depends on a sufficiently large number of its members not exercising a fundamental human right, how can such a right be universal? And now let's go to the individual. Moreover, only a woman whose mother has not exercised her universal human right to abort is able to exercise her own. But a right that someone can exercise only because someone else did not, how can it be by definition be a universal right? I have never seen it as clearly expressed as in those statements, and I wish I could take credit for them. There were previous speakers to DDP that mentioned the root uh, of the problem, which is really eugenics. Steve Mosher talked many years ago, 2008, Robert Zubrin in his talks and in his book, Merchants of Death, talks about that as well. I want to give credit where credit is due. Now let's go from 30,000, 40,000 feet down to Earth. What you see there is right here our corner of Texas and adjacent New Mexico. We have an entirely different situation in New Mexico from the one in Texas. It's not quite entirely so. Texas passed about three years ago so-called heartbeat law, which made abortion impossible past six weeks. And since many women don't even know they are pregnant before that time, it has essentially outlawed in Texas elective abortions. That really came into force when then the US Supreme Court repealed Roe v. Wade. New Mexico, on the other hand, in, 19, in 2021, in anticipation or in order to protect the universal human right to abortion in New Mexico, uh, repealed a law that had been in the books in New Mexico forever, 60, 70, 80 years, what have you, um, prohibiting abortion, but which had been inoperative because of Roe v. Wade, as long as that was still in force. So as soon as Roe v. Wade was repealed by the Supreme Court in New Mexico, you could continue to get abortions for any and no reason from conception until birth. So... Um, on the uh, right side, you see three little scissors against a pinkish background near Las Cruces, north of here. Right there. You see one pair of scissors down here, which is, uh, it says Sunland Park, it's actually Santa Teresa, which is right here on the west side of El Paso, straight across the state line from here, in New Mexico. That is where abortions are being done today. Or maybe I should more accurately say every day except Sunday. So there are three abortion mills right now in uh, Las Cruces and one in Santa Teresa. I have protested in front of the one in uh, Santa Teresa many, many times. So you think that in New Mexico we are abortion friendly and in Texas we are not. Well, there's a problem. And that problem is those orange fields with the red writing. And you see them both in New Mexico and in Texas. Because in late 19, uh, 2022, you, I, you can tell my age, um, 
the Veterans Administration decided to allow and promote abortions within the Veteran Administration health system. So every VA clinic and every VA hospital is at least potentially an abortion mill. And that doesn't matter what state they are in. Um, I'm sure they could be sued in Texas, uh, maybe by the state, but then that would drag on endlessly, most likely. So abortion is here. And by the way, while we have no more elective abortions in, uh, in Texas, we now have abortion tourism coming into New Mexico. And uh, last year alone, New Mexico had roughly 21,000 abortions, out of which 14,000 were mostly by Texas residents. And of course, this is only the number we know of. The real number is most likely much higher, especially since now over 60% of all abortions are done with a so-called abortion pill, a two-pill regime. The first one uh, starves the baby, and the second one expels it. And there's no telling when that expulsion takes place. So, uh, in effect, uh, domestic bathrooms and hotel bathrooms uh, are now abortion mills. There were two people very uh, much uh, at the forefront of uh, getting rid of elective abortions in Texas, and the fellow on the right, Mark Lee Dixon, he started a um, project, a Sanctuary Cities for the Unborn. He started over in Texas, and there are many uh, towns and cities in Texas, and I have a list out there at the table outside the doors. Uh, you may have seen uh, there's pro-life and abolition uh, literature and other materials there. And then Jonathan Mitchell is a past uh, solicitor general of the state of Texas who is supporting this effort and he helps communities write their um, ordinances that make uh, abortion virtually impossible uh, and he actually volunteers to represent them for free if they have uh, if they are facing legal consequences for that um, Let's go to the next one. So, here we have a map of New Mexico on the right-hand side. I'll go into that here in a second, but let's look at the left side. In the history of New Mexico, we are really great humanitarians in New Mexico. 2007, we said cockfighting was, you know, immoral and reprehensible. 2009, we abolished capital punishment for convicted murderers and rapists. 2016, horse slaughter went out. 2019, coyote, coyote killing contests. But in 21, as I mentioned before, we legalized capital punishment in the womb. The other numbers I already mentioned to you. So let's go back to the map. I live in Carlsbad, and my wife and I live in Carlsbad, and we have been active there in the pro-life movement for the last 40, 45 years. Uh, this is Eddy County right there. The blue, the area framed in blue here, these are counties and cities in New Mexico that followed the example of adjacent Texas communities and passed ordinances that make abortion impossible. And the vehicle they used for that in a state that by state law allows abortion was, they said there's a federal law on the books that prohibits the mailing or shipping of any abortion-related drugs, paraphernalia, etc. And so before somebody wants to start an abortion business in our town, they have to get a license, and one condition for the license is you have to comply with every federal law, including that one, which makes it impossible. There's a small town on the east side of Albuquerque, in the center of the state, Edgewood. They passed the same kind of ordinance. I've been trying f for quite a while to get uh, my city, Carlsbad, and surrounding county, Eddy County, to, do, to follow the example of our eastern neighbors. So far, it's like a Jewish dissident asking the Soviet government to emigrate to, the, to Israel. But I won't let up. Uh, this is especially ironic because uh, at the entrance uh, on every major road coming into my home county of Eddy, uh, there is this beautiful sign honoring God, family, and country. And the gentlemen on the bottom are the current county commissioners, and you see my opinion on them. 
Let's look a little bit now into the past strategies and um, tactics that the pro-life movement has used. Because let's face it, we have done this for 50 plus years, and where has it led us? We have n had no really genuine success. You know, we have, we have uh, pro-life dinners up there. This one is one for the New York area, the Union League Club, probably a pretty swanky place. I've never been there. And uh, you can be a sponsor of this place uh, with, for example, a sponsorship named after Bill and James Buckley for 50 grand. And you can have another one named in somebody else's honor. Uh, by the way, this uh, outfit gave an, uh, a Pro-Life of the Year award uh, to... Um, What's her name? The lady who ran for president, um, Carly Fiorina, uh, way back in, what, 2016, as a great defender of life. Now, uh, I uh, would wager money that nobody has ever heard here in this room of Carly Fiorina b being a big promoter and defender of the unborn, but for some reason... Uh, she got that award. Then uh, a few years ago, uh, some pro-life organizations came up with the idea, well, we need a unifying flag. So we have that there on the lower left. Um, if you look at that flag and you know a little bit about advertising, advertising design, you say, what the hell did these people think? You can't even figure out what's on that flag. Then we, of course, have on the lower right, we have an example, these cemeteries for the unborn. Uh, they haven't done much either, but I like at least the sign because the bottom of the sign says, pray and act. That's the old commandment by St. Benedict, ora et labora. So not just pray about it, but do something, work on it. So I'm quite comfortable with that. But again, these cemeteries, they usually put these uh, crosses into the lawn at some public place and they are there for a month or so and then they take them out and then they wait a year and then they put them out again. The, these are normally not, uh, or mostly not permanent installations. And by the way, after a while, people just keep driving by, they become part of the furniture and you know nobody pays attention to them anymore. The uh, next slide actually makes that point much more uh, vocally. Uh, on the uh, upper left is dedicated to the sanctity of life. That's in front of the Catholic, uh, one of the two Catholic churches in Carlsbad. And it was sponsored by the San Jose uh, Catholic Daughters of America, court number umpty squad. And then um, that's bad enough because that church is not particularly pro-life. It's Catholic and yeah, we're pro-life and they donate to the pregnancy center, but other than that, there's nothing happening there. Um, the other plaque on the upper right, that to me is deeply offensive, if not even obscene. A tribute to the unborn, past and future. That's in a pro-life little memorial on a church uh, in Northeast El Paso. Uh, now, just to explain why I find this obscene, imagine, oh, 1943 Germany, um, a church puts out a memorial to our Jewish friends murdered, past and unborn. But they didn't do a damn thing to prevent it. That's why I find that deeply offensive. And uh, the quote down there on the bottom, that's actually from a writer in the Los Angeles Times who wrote about these memorials. And I fully agree with this pro-choice writer in his assessment of this. I, I don't doubt the sadness, but these memorials and shrines seem less about the aborted and more about themselves. The Knights of Columbus here in El Paso not uh, just not even a month ago, had a big uh, tournament to benefit the, the pregnancy center. Well, the, that tournament was on a Saturday. Saturday is the busiest day in the abortion mill in Santa Teresa, 10, 12 miles away from here, where, you know, I'm chasing a golf ball rather than protesting in front of that abortion mill. What does that say about their engagement? But it gets worse. About two and a half years ago, I spent a Saturday morning from 8 to 12 in front of that abortion mill protesting. I'll show you pictures later on. 
And I knew that at 12 o'clock there was a big pro-life march in downtown El Paso. So after I was done there, because the mill was open from 8 to 12, I went over to the demonstration. There were 300, 400 people there with signs and the flag of the Knights of Columbus and Knights of Columbus decked down, out in their regalia. And I got mad. I walked over to some people and I said, where the hell were you from 8 to 12 this morning? Do you really feel good about yourself right now, marching here in bright sunshine and be saying I'm pro-life? What are you doing about this? You have people murdered over there every day. I'll come back to that. And then we have Democrats for Life. Fortunately, there is such a tiny group of people, Democrats for Life. But they think that if they appeal for paid parental leave and that is pro-life, that they can change things. And then, of course, Catholics for Life and trusting mothers to God through prayer. Again, um, during World War II, would anyone have prayed and trusting SS men to God through prayer? Would that have helped? These are two pictures, one on the left side, um, two demonstrators in front of one abortion mill in Las Cruces, 40 miles north of here along the Rio Grande, the other one in front of the Santa Teresa abortion mill. You see the signs, they are part of the 40 Days for Life campaign, where pro-lifers stand two times a year for 40 days each in front of these mills and demonstrate. Well, these places run 365, or if you count, you know, deduct the weekends, 200, 250 days a year. Where are they the other time? And by the way, these are concentration, no, they are annul, an, annihilation camps. Would anyone stand in front of Auschwitz with smiling faces? I doubt it. So, I learned something from uh, Art Robinson, with his remonstrances that he gives at the Oregon Senate every time. We need to remonstrate as much as we can, and the dictionary definition is right there, earnest presentation of reasons for opposition or grievance. So I use every opportunity, by, by the way, what I'm going to talk about pretty much from now on is what I'm doing just to give you some ideas what can be done. But please do not think that you have to imitate what I'm doing. I just want to throw these out as examples of what can be done. And then every one of us needs to come up with their own ideas. And I think that for the last 50 years we haven't really gotten anywhere. We have saved individual kids, but we haven't really solved any, any of the problem, of the basic problem. So we need to take individual instead of collective responsibility. We need to allow ourselves no excuse, no compromise, no concession. None of this BS about, uh, you know, incest and rape, you know. Uh, rape is violence. And then we respond to it with another violent act. Public dissent, we need to have public dissent and constant visible protest. This befriending of death cult disciples, you know, oh, my friend is uh, pro-choice, but I'm trying to turn him around. And we're just every week or every couple of weeks, we're having a cup of coffee together and I'm working with him. Would I do that with an SS guard from Auschwitz? We need to have all-out resistance and confrontation, relentless opposition. We need to besiege the fortress of child murder. The ultimate aim, again, I'm speaking for myself, but I hope that you agree. The ultimate aim is not conversion, but just like World War II, defeat and unconditional surrender. No alibi. What do I, what do I mean with that? Some of you have been active in the pro-life movement, and I'm sure you have run into that. You talk to somebody else who is basically pro-life but doesn't do anything, and they thank you for your efforts and for your involvement, and they use that as an excuse. Oh, he or she is already doing that. I don't have to do it because they are already doing it, especially if you're a member of the same organization. Well, they already go every Saturday and pray, I don't have to do that. They, they are already doing that. So you sort of delegate the responsibility. And then no indulgences. Indulgences, you know, in their worst case, 
were these, uh, you, you could pay for letting part of your, in, in the old Catholic Church, uh, you could pay for letting, uh, for, for, for getting rid of some of the penance you would other, otherwise have to do in, um, uh, what is it, uh, not, not, not hell, but the intermediate thing, okay? Um, so, pardon? Thank you, purgatory. Yeah, I had a brain block there. Um, and I think you know that too. Uh, you know, you pass the collection plate on Pro-Life Sunday, or you ask for donations, and you have these donors, they send the pregnancy center, you know, a 20 or a 50 or a check for 100 or whatever, uh, maybe once a month or twice a year or whatever. But other than that, you never know that they are pro-life. Basically, in my opinion, they're buying indulgences. And now, since I <laughs> was at one time classically trained, I remember a few things about that. You may remember the story of Cato the Elder, who was a senator in the Roman Senate between the Second and the Third Punic War, the three wars that Rome fought against Carthage. And he ended every speech that he gave in the Roman Senate with this phrase, Ceterum Kenseo Carthaginem Esse Delandam. Whatever subject it was about, I mean, he, he may have talked about the municipal sewer system, but his last sentence was always, by the way, I believe Carthage must be destroyed, because he saw it as an eternal threat if Rome didn't wipe it off the face of the map, which Rome did. And by the way, I can recommend there's a book by, uh, uh, oh, what's his name? Uh, well, anyway, I'll get back to it. And then another Latin phrase and etiam si omnes ego non. Even if everybody else does it, I will not. And this was the motto of the family of the second to last survivor of the uh, assassination attempt on Hitler, the so-called Valkyrie project. So um, I think those are good, uh, good ideas. So now let's go into some ideas that every one of us can do, or at least take as inspiration maybe for something else. For a while, uh, I had address labels on my letters, when we were still writing letters before emails, uh, that had on the bottom of my address in the upper left there, execute abortionists. Uh, then I'm giving away little bottles, uh, old used medicine uh, bottles, pill bottles. I put red paint into them, put a label on there, represents blood of victims, murder in the womb, prayers and donations are too little. And then the quote, rescue those led to slaughter in our backyard. And our backyard is Santa Teresa right there. That's the nearest one to Carlsbad where I'm from. Then I put at the end of each email, there is this phrase, people uh, by Alan Keyes on abortion, and then adults, co adult cowards murder babies in the womb and call it healthcare, reject this vile lie. Oops. What did I do? I screwed up. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay, and I haven't used the one yet on the bottom right uh, that I'll put maybe in the future on the bottom of my emails. Don't love murder on the womb? Cat got your tongue? If you don't say anything about it and nobody else knows about it, what the hell good is it? Then the standard stuff. Put a pro-life plate on the front of your vehicle, put pro-life stickers on the back of your vehicle. By the, one, by, by the way, the one on the lower right there, stop feeding abortion, Sam, those stickers are for free out there. Take some on the way home. And then I used to have a pickup. And I had a friend who was a good welder, put a little steel frame on there, and I put four by eight posters on there, and you see him there. Planned Parenthood married to abortion equals mass murder incorporated. And abortion, the ultimate child abuse. So I parked that occasionally in front of real busy places in town. Occasionally got the window broken or tires slashed but um, it's worth it at least to bring it up and keep it before the public. That's a sign right on my house on the right, abortion is always wrong, the wrong choice, and my vehicle is parked right out there with those uh, magnetic stickers, shows a 10-week baby killed in an abortion. These are just some rough ideas. Then. Uh, 
I'm sure everyone has parades, whether for Veterans Day or Independence Day or Memorial Day, what have you. And this one is one that I used on, Memor on uh, Veterans Day. On the back of my uh, SUV, I did our fallen heroes really fight and die, that we may murder babies in the womb, and then VA abortions accept unacceptable collateral casualties. Uh, we started a project, unfortunately it has not become very fruitful, just a little bit. Um, every pro-life church should have as part of their marquee, we are pro-life or another pro-life church. So there is in the upper left a ba uh, Baptist uh, uh, church and on the lower right, that's a congregation that my wife is a member of, uh, Kei Lat Yeshua, uh, they emphasize the Jewish root of Christianity, and you see another pro-life congregation. But, you know, why don't we have those everywhere? Why doesn't every pro-life church have that? Why doesn't every pro-life professional have something like that in the window? You know, an attorney, an accountant, whatever. We need to display our pro-life culture and credentials. Because if we do, we might keep or squeeze the other side out. Unfortunately, this sign is not from Carlsbad. I just found this on the internet. But you know, physicians and hospitals should have signs like that in front of them. So that those of us who are pro-life can identify who is in accord with us and avoid and shun and boycott the others. So now a little bit to what can you do protesting in front of an abortion mill. In Santa Teresa, we are somewhat lucky. You see there, there's a very wide right of way in front of the abortion mill, up to 25 to 30 feet wide and about 300, 400 feet long. And you see for scale just this lady with her three kids who is just there for a day. And I tell you, may I have a show of hand? Who has ever spent time demonstrating or praying in front of an abortion mill? Thank you. Okay. But I spent hours in front of this. And... I get my best ideas of what to do and what other things I can possibly do while being there. And so that quote from Samuel Johnson comes to mind. You know, it doesn't apply just to only to people who are, wait, who are waiting to be executed, but it also applies to people who are demonstrating or spending time in front of a place of execution. Because when I stand there, I am thinking about what if that were my brother, my cousin, my sister, my mo whatever, and I heard the shots where they, they are lined up against the wall like they were in Dachau or in Auschwitz, and there is a little, you know, a depression in the ground and the blood is running out of the place, because that's what's happening inside there. And if you spend some time in front of these places, then your gears start moving, or mine at least do. So that is, for me, an extremely valuable source of inspiration. I mean, aside from just making my protest known. So I have signs made. I, we have a professional sign maker in Carlsbad, and I come up with all kinds of ideas. And you see a few of them. And especially for the physicians, of course, interesting, probably the one on the lower right, to inform the people who go into that place of the abortion pill reversal possibility. If you have taken the first pill, then you have a 24 to 48 hour window or thereabouts where you could, you know, take a, a counter indication that could prevent the abortion from actually going through. And some other examples here of signs. The same building that the abortion mill is in Santa Teresa, there's a regular clinic. So I have a sign there, Clinic 2 murders babies with the appropriate symbol, Clinic 1 heals patients. And then I use dolls that I get at the um, Goodwill store or Salvation Army store. I paint them red just like that doll that's hanging out there on the table and hang them in the trees in front of it. Of course, there are the people who keep the landscaping straight and they remove them every time that they get a chance. But I put them up again. Um, on the west side is also the Santa Teresa Airport. Those who went on the tour uh, heard that there is a Santa Teresa um, 
uh, border uh, checkpoint. So these are my signs that I put up there. And there's a kid, you know, wearing one that's especially brutal, freshly butchered baby humans a la UNM, University of New Mexico. The University of New Mexico runs its own abortion place in Albuquerque, right on the road to the airport. And then, oh, on the right-hand side, you see death zone for babies. And then above that, you see one of those garden lantern hanging poles, also with two dolls hanging on it. I have become an expert at putting nooses together for these dolls. And here is, I have first a sign, visualize abortion. Then there are those gallows with those dolls hanging on them. And then after, after that, there's a sign, it's actually worse. Now, a mother stopped one time and berated me, you know, you, how can you do that? My daughter was in the car with me, blah, 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 blah. And I said, okay, uh, you're getting so excited about something that deals with dolls. Why aren't you excited about the real thing going on right there? Blah, 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 blah. So, um, but just to defend myself a little bit more, I was... Um, at a Gem and Mineral show in Carlsbad a few weeks ago, and there was a guy with a T-shirt. And the T-shirt had that lower picture on it, on the front, cannibal corpse, and then on the back, butchered at birth. And I had no idea what that was. And I asked him, is that a band? And he said, yes. And he was there with his good-looking wife and with two kids, and he was wearing that T-shirt. So this is a, uh, what is it called, a death rock band. So uh, next time somebody berates me about the gallows over there, then I can tell them, you know, you're dealing with much worse in our so-called popular culture. Uh, by the way, the <laughs> little humorous side note, if there is any humor in this subject, um, I found the instructions for how to put these gallows together in a, a U.S. Army manual about field executions <laughs> from World War II. <laughs> That's on the internet. Um, then some other signs. Uh, under the same roof is a state farm agency. So I walked in there and I, I, I told them, how can, how can you do this here? And under the same roof, you know, uh, life insurance, selling in the same building where they're killing babies. Well, they, they actually called the police on me, okay? And then they said, no, no trespassing, what have you. I talked to my own. I have all of my, li all of my insurance, car, house, uh, life, everything, with a State uh, Farm, with the agent in Carlsbad. And I talked to my agent over there. And she said, oh, I know this lady who owns that agency. And I said, could you talk to her? I never heard back. It's, uh, I mean, when, when I uh, listened to Dr. Anstrom, I... Uh, I felt reminded of uh, when I talked to our county commission and when I talked to our city councillors and when I talked to this agent, you know, it's uh, if I ignore the problem, then it will go away by itself. So um, I have some pretty harsh signs there. Stop murdering children. And then uh, I put in somewhat smaller print, judicially execute abortionists instead so they can't accuse me of... Uh, I guess I'm a little scared because over in Germany, hate speech can now be punished with jail. Um, so, uh, oh, and then the lower right, pick on humans your own side, that is always directed to the entrance to the abortion mill, and the names up there are the names of the abortionist up on the top, Franz Thayert is his name, and then his helpers and his guards. And uh, by the way, this does not go w without controversy. In that picture there on the right-hand side, you see some people didn't like my science. So um, if you are a single human being and uh, are trying to cover three or 400 feet of street front with your science, you can't be at both ends at the same time. So I'm over there, and then somebody gets out of the car and rips stuff off and bends them and tramples on them, etc. Et on the lower right there, that sign says, uh, the company we keep. And and Santa Teresa, Auschwitz, Treblinka, Subibor. And then at the front, uh, you can get Santa Teresa is not quite, but it's almost like a gated community. And so there's really only that one entrance road. So I had these signs there on a metal sawhorse, uh, community of infamy, magnet of abortion, and then banish the infamy of abortion from this community. And obviously somebody didn't like those signs either. Uh, by the way, then I called the sheriff's department and the police, and they came out there and say, uh, they said, do you want to press charges? Because the guy who did it, he actually parked there, and then he 
argued with me. And I said yes, and of course I never heard anything about it. Um, those of you who have had some art history probably uh, have seen these two pictures on the left. Uh, the one on the uh, far left is um, by Francisco Goya. Um, uh, uh, Saturn devouring his children, and then uh, the one in the middle is the same subject by Peter Paul Rubens, and so I asked a local artist, a friend of my wife, to turn this uh, Rubens picture into a picture with Uncle Sam, and that's where the that sticker came from, Stop Feeding Abortion Sam. Now, I thought that after the repeal of Roe v. Wade that I couldn't use that sticker anymore, but with the current administration, hell yes. There's a friend of mine there. Um, a lot of this stuff is trial and error. There is a traffic island, as you can see in that picture, and he's on that traffic island, but the cars are just too fast for these small signs, so we're not using them anymore there. We, we need bigger signs, so but it's trial and error, really. And I am not a you know advertising design specialist. This is the guy who does the abortions. Uh, he has a bench um, right between his uh, gynecological practice and where he does abortions. Uh, did used to do abortions in El Paso. He doesn't do them anymore because he, he can't do them in Texas anymore. So he lives on Rim Road. For those of you who were in the field trip, that fancy neighborhood up there on the side of the mountain. He lives right there. I pointed it out to the fellow who was sitting next to me. And uh, you see on that bench, he has his advertising out there. And I know from talking to some ladies that he has a very good reputation as an OBGYN. Look at the bench. He specializes in high-risk obstetrics. So he's definitely a schizophrenic bastard. Uh, you know, he saves babies here and he kills them over there. And there's a demonstration in front of his house that we did one time. Um, this is from Carlsbad. Uh, we have a so-called annual mayor, uh, mayor's prayer breakfast, so I put out all kinds of signs there. Do you think I would ever f hear back from any one of the local ministers on any of this stuff? And the sign on the left there says abortion pills turn bathrooms into death chambers. I got that from a British website. Uh, some British pro-lifers go with that sign actually right downtown London. And they have some more brutal stuff they show. Um, okay, now one additional strategy. Last year we had elections for mayor in El Paso. Now, I'm not a political person, but I thought, well, that's a chance to just uh, advance a pro-life cause. So I just threw my head in the ring. I signed up for, you know, and I was actually first on the ballot. Now, I didn't win. I got 159 votes, and the guy who won got 2,500 or 2,700. But I had ads in the paper. I, had, I went to the candidate forums, participated in them, and every question that was turned at me, I took the same strategy as Cato the Elder in Old Rome. I answered the question and then I turned it to abortion and I said, by the way, blah, 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 blah. And so every one of us can do that. And every one of us can go to city council and county meetings where at the end or at the beginning, they give the public a chance, each one individual, to talk for three minutes and you can give them a piece of your mind. And that's the way these communities in, uh, to the east of us, along the state line with Texas, they finally got their county commissions and city councils to, issue the, uh, to, to pass those ordinances that make their uh, communities abortion free. And I'm telling our people, you just need to emulate them. You just need to take their papers, their, their um, ordinance, and just fill in your name and then do the same thing. So far, I haven't had any luck. Put things into perspective. El Paso, 2019, had this infamous Walmart shooting where I think right now the number of fatalities has gone up to 25 or 26 and about two or three times as many people who uh, got injured. Uh, as a result of that, in the middle of the Walmart parking lot, less than five miles from here, uh, there is this big memorial to them. Well, uh, on that same day, according to a colleague who also demonstrated at the abortion mill in Santa Teresa, exactly that many babies were killed in that abortion mill. For these people, 
they put up this big memorial, which will probably be there forever. Uh, there was, uh, there were um, baseball caps and flags and signs and whatever. El Paso strong in response to that, and uh, our host here uh, knows that. Um, a uh, El Paso composer composed an El Paso Requiem that was um, premiered by the El Paso Symphony. I saw you there. Um, so all kinds of efforts. I was in front of the um, Plaza Theater downtown with a sign make, making people aware of that. I think one or two people stopped and the rest pretended there was nothing there. They commemorated this, but the abortions, nobody wants to hear about it. And you all know what the response is to a mass shooting. You know, you see the pictures on the bottom, people come and put candles and flowers and teddy bears and whatever, and up the upper picture there's all these teddy bears after a snowfall. So my idea, if I had the means, I would uh, basically have a pickup load full of this stuff got, gotten from, let's say, um, a Salvation Army or a Goodwill store and all pile them together and maybe even have them tied together in some fashion and every day that places in business put a pile of these things in front of the abortion mill. Why not? But it takes, you know, one person can do so much, but nevertheless, even one person can do something. If we wait for somebody else, we may wait forever. We have no excuse not to do it individually on our own. And eventually, I think we need to do harsher things, such as the Red Rose rescues that some people are doing in Washington, D.C., and going to jail for them. Um, one out, oh, uh, in your package is a list of uh, further information sources on uh, various, uh, you know, abortion uh, or pro-life and abolition groups. And by the way, there's a difference between pro-life and abolition. Pro-lifers are basically sort of the medics. The abolitionists try to get rid of abortion. And sometimes you have, you know, uh, people who have a foot in on each side, but basically you can, you can make that distinction. So if we want to abolish it, I think eventually we have to risk jail. And some people are already doing this today. The next picture shows you, if you have never heard of this lady, you need to hear about her, Joan Andrews Bell. She did her first rescues in, I think, the late 70s or early 80s. She has meanwhile, I, I believe, spent on the order of 10 to 12 years cumulatively in jail for doing rescues. And her position is there is no such thing as done enough when babies are slaughtered. And then when they are in jail, they need help. So they need pro-life jail support. I'm just about done. I hope I helped motivate you. I can't really motivate you. We can only motivate each one of us ourselves. But to turn from a platonic pro-lifer or a crypto pro-lifer, nobody else knows you are a pro-lifer, you live in the catacombs, to becoming a relentless abortion abolitionist. We don't have to be willing to go to jail, but there's a heck of a lot of stuff we can do below that threshold or above that threshold whichever way you look at it. Our fellow human beings deserve no less. Um, what excuse do we have not to do it? Um, what excuse did uh, most of the churches and most of the Americans, uh, most of the American population have between basically 1820 and 1865 not to do something about slavery? And we know historically what that, what, what happened as a result of that. Eventually it took a civil war to get rid of it. And what happened when most halfway decent and mostly decent Germans didn't speak up in the beginning? And it took World War II. And again, medics are absolutely necessary, but they are absolutely insufficient to do the job. So let me leave you with a few quotes. Robert Heinlein, the famous science fiction author, everything in excess to enjoy the flavor of life, take big bites. Moderation is for monks. And you have seen those cartoons, especially the left one was very popular in offices all around the country. And then the one on the upper right, you know, this miner there digging towards the diamond pipe and he finally, I said, enough gives up, 
never give up. And then on the bottom right, that's the Berlin Wall. I would never have thought that during my lifetime I would see the Berlin Wall fall, but it did. So if that is possible, and if the Iron Curtain fell, unfortunately Russia is almost as bad as the Soviet Union these days, but nevertheless, uh, dozens of millions of people were freed. It's possible, so this is possible too. Um, Ken used my lump of coal here, which I put out here, and I had a, uh, an intention for that one, and that was every one of us, regardless of how little or how much we have done or are doing pro-life, deserves a gigantic lump of coal for not doing more, and that includes me, my wife, and everybody else. We all deserve that. Um, I have out there on the table a bunch of, uh, uh, quite a variety of materials, including a um, thumb drive available for free to anyone with my presentation I gave today and the one I gave five years ago, plus additional supporting material. And um, last comment, uh, I might, well, or second to last, I feel uh, perfectly comfortable be, be, uh, to be the second to last speaker because, let's face it, the pre-born are usually the last on our mind, so I think I'm in good company. Uh, let me just leave you with uh, maybe a couple. This one is a little funny. Uh, this is uh, an uh, engraving depicting Mary and Elizabeth. And of course, the, fa the, the story goes that uh, as Mary approached Elizabeth, uh, uh, St. John in her womb was, uh, you know, uh, stirring and welcoming the Savior. And that reminded me of the quote by Robert Jastrow, who was also a previous speaker here at, uh, at DDP, uh, that uh, it happens to many scientists as they pull him themselves over the final rock in the search of uh, solving a problem, they're greeted by a band of theologians who have been sitting there for centuries. Um, um, so, uh, you know, th this is not something new. This has been known to, uh, that, that these are, I mean, uh, the question that anyone should ask their, 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 their pro-choice priest or minister is, uh, would you advocate for the right of Mary to have been able to abort Jesus? <laughs> And uh, the last one, Robert George, uh, the philosophy professor from uh, Princeton, whom some of you recognize, um, instead of waiting for a group or somebody to be a leader, we have an individual responsibility, and I think he makes the point very uh, nicely. Virtues are not built or distributed by campaign. They are acquired one man, and of course woman included, one deed at a time, one man, because virtue is about character, character is individual, and deed, because virtues are built up by repetitive actions, one deed at a time. Thank you.